Here's your word for the day from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Visit us on the web at calvaryaz.com. Hello, hello, I'm Pastor Sean, and I have your word for the day. We're in Matthew 5, verses 31 through 32. This is where Jesus teaches us his commands and thoughts on divorce. Now, this video won't be a super in-depth look at the ins and outs of divorce, as it probably should be, but if you are looking for more resources on the topic of divorce, uh, go to calvaryaz.com sermons and find the week 10 sermon of our 1 Corinthians series, and it's all about divorce and redemption there. Uh, Pastor Chad, Pastor Rick, Jamie, and Kathy go a little more in-depth de- in on the subject. Anyways, our passage today is short. But before we read it, I need to say that if if you are with a husband or a wife who is abusive to you verbally, physically, or other, then please, please get help. Jesus has some pretty clear thoughts on divorce and subsequently marriage, but I truly believe that Jesus would not want you to put up with an abuse in marriage. Will there be hardships? Yes. Arguments? Yes. Frustrations and growth opportunities? Yes and yes. Lots of those things. But abuse should be addressed right away. Get help. Reach out. Seek counsel. So let's read our passage and then we'll jump on in. So Matthew 5, 31 through 32, it says this. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, when Jesus taught this, there was a lot of controversy surrounding it because a certain king had just divorced his wife to be with his mistress. This was the king John John the Baptist confronted about his divorce, and then John had his head cut off because of it. So you can imagine it was a touchy subject back then as it is now. So please don't cut off anyone's head. But Jesus, in his teaching, stuck to what he'd planned for marriage all along, which is divorce isn't an option. Marriage is supposed to be this beautiful image of our triune God, the perfect co-unity between the Holy Spirit, the Son, and the Father. And this union is never ending. So those who enter into marriage, who dare go before our triune God and say, we desire to represent this image of God and then promise till death do us part, you have entered into a very serious but beautiful and blessed covenant between you, your spouse, and God. Marriage and divorce is not a matter we should take so lightly. Not that you do, but what I mean is we don't get to define what either of these things are. Marriage, by God's definition, the one who created it, is one husband, one wife, and one lifetime. And remember, it's meant to be a reflection of God's being and perfect co-unity. So divorce, being the thing that separates what is meant to stay together forever, is a pretty serious subject. And its appropriateness is only understood through Jesus' teachings. So of course, I'll reiterate what I said earlier, abuse is never okay, do what you have to do. And honestly, anyone who abuses their husband or wife probably isn't fit for marriage in the first place and should either be held accountable to change or lose their ability to abuse others. Uh, But other than that, Jesus gives one other reason where divorce is an option, and that's sexual immorality, unchastity. But even this needs to be understood in the context of marriage. So we enter into this contract or covenant with our significant others, and, and what's the thing that makes it valid? It's our ability and design to have intimate, sexual, and familiar relationship with that one other person. You don't get to go around having intercourse with anyone but this person. And I don't care how much people think we're just animals or God designed us for this union. Uh, Sorry, God designed us for this union, not promiscuity. Don't let your sinful flesh justify itself. So sexual morality is, in turn the breaking of this covenant that was made between a man, a woman, and before God. What's interesting here is the word here for sexual morality in the Greek is porneia, which it's pretty straightforward in its definition. It's illicit sexual intercourse, meaning you have a partner who is continually choosing to break that precious marriage covenant by doing those sexual acts. The interesting thing about this word though is that the other included definition is idolatry. So sexual immorality is like idolatry. And idolatry is choosing to worship idols over worshiping the living and active and only God. And please understand this, that this, this thing, idolatry, this is the thing that God despises more than most other things. So if there is cheating 
adultery and chastity within your marriage relationship, it's similar to us cheating on God. Jesus tells us we can, we can divorce those who are continually choosing to be sexually immoral because it's as if they aren't in a marriage covenant with you at all. They don't act like it. Now, please note, there is a difference between someone who is actively or unashamedly pursuing to break the, the marriage vows and someone who has broken them, but by their words, by their actions, by the fruit that they show and the accountability that they put around there, around themselves are repenting of their sexual immorality. Again, God defines this for us with his actions towards us. God despises idolatry and sexual immorality more than we ever could. And yet every single day, each of us sin against God by being idolatrous and pursuing or being, being drawn to other objects of worship other than God. But daily, hourly, minute by minute, second by second, God is willing to forgive us and he keeps his covenant promise to us. That is, if we are repentant and turn back to him, this is the beauty of the gospel, that is. And the gospel being God's ultimate plan and purpose for our lives is what we use as our foundation to understand marriage and divorce. You see, we can't follow God if we purposely, continually, and unashamedly choose to be unfaithful to God. And the same is true for those whose husbands and wives who've cheated on their significant others are continually unfaithful to them. But if a person is truly repentant and they turn from their sexual morality and back to their spouse, then I dare say Jesus would want you to understand the gospel and pursue forgiving them and making the relationship right first before even considering divorce as an option. This, of course, is a case-by-case -case thing and the decision should never be made alone. Always seek counsel and help, especially if there's a marriage that was broken and could possibly be mended. I know this isn't an easy subject and sometimes we're so blindsided by life and marriages that, that end in unfaithfulness, but divorce should always be the last option with unfaithfulness or with other things, not an option at all. And Jesus is pretty straightforward about this. Now, I'm not here to scrutinize your past divorces, even if they were for the wrong reasons, it's not for me to judge in that sense. But I will say, learning about divorce really has one main purpose. The realization that we need to strengthen our marriages right now. They are that important. Unfaithfulness starts way before the act itself. So if you're listening to this and you are married, or maybe you're going to be married soon, two things. Number one, take divorce out of your vocabulary. It isn't something we should be considering unless those two other reasons are active and present. And number two, ask yourself, are you actively trying to strengthen your marriage? If it's a no, then some would say that you're actively trying to hurt it. So real quick, how do you strengthen your marriage? By focusing in on God and the promise you made before him. It's not by trying to have more fun or trying to be happy in that marriage. Marriage can produce happiness and fun, yes, but you strengthen your marriage by getting on your knees and praying together by opening up the word of God together and meditating on it day and night, by encouraging each other to service an active community within the church. You strengthen your marriage by reminding your spouse of the gospel every single day. My hope is that we take marriage seriously and are so incredibly blessed by the marriages we're in because they represent something more than just us. But that can only happen when we focus in on God, the one who made them and we take divorce out of our vocabulary. Turn back to one another. Stop whatever sexual or moral thing you are doing and repent in order to save your marriage. So, hey, if you made it this far into the video, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I don't want this to be a one-sided conversation as, as hard of a conversation as it is. So what are your thoughts on Matthew 5, 31 through 32? Keep it civil, and as always, have a great day, Calvary. Be blessed.